Welcome to the Mile High Five Podcast. I am your host, Carl Jensen, and I am here with Doug Cunnington. And we have a very special guest today. Tell us who you are and what you do. Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. First off, uh, super excited to be here. Um, my name is Dan Sheeks, and in a nutshell, I am a high school business teacher. Uh, I live in Denver, Colorado. I, I wrote a book for teenagers about early financial independence that was published by Bigger Pockets, just came out a couple of weeks ago. There's also a workbook that goes along with that. And I also facilitate an online community for young people who are interested in early financial independence. And it's called Sheik's Freaks. And that's my gig. That's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And before we open up, I'd like to mention I was at your book release party at the Bigger Pockets headquarters a couple of weeks ago. And I guess I went there with no expectations, but I was kind of surprised because a bunch of your tribe, the Sheik's Freaks, were there. So all these yeah. young, super enthusiastic, I'm dating myself here, but I'm going to say kids were, had flown in. A lot of them, I think one was, a couple were from the East Coast and some were from California. All these people who were connected with you were there for your book release party. And I was not expecting that. So one of the things I want to talk about later in the call is how you actually connect to these younger kids, because I think they are the hardest ones to reach. And I've been wildly unsuccessful as far as I know in, in those own, in my own efforts to do that. Yeah. Our, our Sheik's Freaks community is, is amazing. Um, full of young people from across the country and, and the community is really 15 to 25, kind of that, that age range. Um, and it's been going on for about two years and uh, yeah, we've made some great friendships and connections and it's fun for me to watch these young people just crush it. And, and they are doing exactly that. Yeah, Doug, I'm not sure what you were doing when you were 15, but I sure as hell was not learning <laughs> about personal finance. I remember I liked to read and my parents got the newspaper, the old paper thing that showed up your house every day. And I'd always toss the the business section like I have no, I could, could not care less about this. But yeah, let's talk about you. Let's talk about your background a little bit, Dan. Uh, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And did your parents teach you about money? Um, yeah, I grew up in Iowa. Um, my parents were divorced. And so in my house, it was basically my mom, uh, my sister, and myself. My sister is one year younger than I am. My mom did, I think, the best she could to teach us about money. And, and it was, she did an okay job. Uh, I definitely learned to be responsible with money, meaning that I always paid my bills on time. I didn't spend a lot. And, you know, I, I think frugality was kind of part of our household, but didn't really go much beyond that. And, and I, I mean, I think that's pretty typical for, for everyone. For most people in our country, we don't, either at home or in school, we don't get much beyond just some basic money advice or, or a background. So um, it wasn't until years later that I, kind of like you guys, you know, found the different tactics and strategies involved with early financial independence and started investing in ways to build wealth. So, yeah. Pretty typical, I'd say. And you had two separate stints in college. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I, I did my undergrad at a small college in Iowa and got a degree in marketing or a business degree. And really, I just wanted to, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think that's pretty typical as well for young people who are in college or on their way to college. Um, and so business made sense to me because it seemed like a pretty a degree that could serve a lot of purposes. Um, and also I wanted to make a lot of money when I was young. I mean, I think that was my main goal. I just wanted to be rich, but didn't really put a lot of thought into that. And then in my later twenties, decided to go back to school to get my license to be a teacher. Um, I think I kind of grew up, but you know, in my early twenties, I did some traveling and um, experienced life and met people and, and kind of realized that making a ton of money wasn't Maybe the most important thing uh, in serving, making a difference, having a job that would be fulfilling was more important. And so decided to be a teacher, a high school teacher and teach business classes. So I went back to school. Um, at that point, I had moved to Colorado here. So I went to Colorado State University, got my teaching degree and started teaching. I think I started teaching when I was 29 years old. So I have a follow-up question. You said when you were young, you wanted to be rich. What was your image of a rich person like when you were young? Oh, that's that's a great question. I don't I don't really know that I had an image. I th I think it was more of a 
you know, someone who didn't have to stress about money, someone who didn't have to think about every nickel and dime they were spending and how that would affect other purchase decisions. So someone who could just live life, buy what they wanted to, do what they wanted to, and not have to stress about money. I think that's kind of what that's kind of what I wanted. And I, I've come to realize that you don't have to have millions and millions of dollars to achieve that. You just have to have financial independence. Yeah. And that was a pretty great definition of rich for a young person. I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother lived near me. And whenever we went to her house, she would always have, if the time was right, she would always have this show on called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, this Robin Leach English guy. Oh, Did yeah. you ever see that? Or? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. I've seen that. Yep. Yeah. And I remember, I think the opening was like, he's on a yacht and he's got champagne and and these shows showed what the this show showed what the mega rich li- lived like, all these huge mansions and fancy cars and all that. So when I was a kid, that was my image of of a rich person. We have to live in some massive house and fly around in a in a helicopter. And, and then you grow older, and I remember reading the Millionaire Next Door, and it turns out that that rich people don't live like that. And in your book, you even mentioned it. They went to the upper middle class neighborhoods. And it turns out those people, while they looked rich, they weren't actually rich. It's the people who live a more modest lifestyle that have all the money. Yeah. Great book. That That's a great book that you mentioned. Um, and I quoted a few times in my book. Yeah. I think the people who are millionaires, the millionaire next, next door says, you know, they're not people that you would typically guess. And the people who have the flashy lifestyle are typically also people who don't have a lot of net worth, a lot of wealth built up. They just, cause they spend everything they make. And so it's kind of goes back to that, that choice. You can either look rich or you can be rich. Now the lifestyles of the rich and famous. I do remember that show with Robin Leach. Uh, those people are a whole nother, you know, I, that's like the top 1% of the 1%. So they're that lifestyle. I, it was never one where I thought I could or wanted to achieve that. Those people are just uber rich. And I don't think I'll ever know that world and that's okay. You mentioned that you started teaching when you were 29. So what were your 20s like? What kind of work were you doing? You mentioned you traveled a little bit. Can you expand a little bit on the 20s? Yeah. When I graduated college, I was 21. I just wasn't ready to get a real job yet or, or a corporate job. I had kind of got the travel bug in college, had done some traveling. And so I just decided to keep doing that until I kind of figured things out. So at that point, I had a friend who was moving to London to do a study abroad program and I joined him and I did a work abroad program. And then from there, just kept moving every six months or so, traveled uh, all across the country. I lived in uh, London, obviously, at St. Thomas for six months. I lived in Montana, Idaho, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, Vermont, and just kind of yeah, just lived a, a nomad lifestyle. I, I was working a lot so I could pay for all of that. Every time I'd move somewhere, I'd have one or two or three jobs sometimes, but just really kind of enjoyed exploring and uh, meeting people from from all around the world. And that that was a lot of fun. I wouldn't trade that for anything. It definitely prolonged my journey to financial independence, which I didn't even know was a thing back then. Um, I was just enjoying life and doing what I wanted to do. But then in the later, in my later twenties decided, you know, I, I probably should get a real job at some time. Uh, I should use that degree that I had. That was when I found out actually that I could teach business in high school. I didn't know that was a thing. And once I found out that was an option, it kind of all just worked out. And I said, well, teaching sounds like a great job because it is fulfilling. It is rewarding. I, I would feel like I was making a difference. And if I can teach marketing and business, which is what I was really passionate about, then that just made sense to me. So went down that road. So I'm kind of curious, you went for a business degree, but then I guess you do kind of use it now because you're a teacher who teaches business, but Mm -hmm. you never had a job doing the books or I I don't know, even know what a business major does. You didn't do, you didn't work for a marketing firm or anything like that. Did you ever have any desire to do that or did the education turn you off from that? Yeah, I I never really did have a full-time permanent marketing or business job. Uh, I had some temporary ones as I was moving around. It just didn't, the the nine to five until you're 65 grind and doing that 12 months a year, just never, it just wasn't something I wanted to do. And so teaching, one of the draws to teaching, honestly, was that I got my summers off. I had, you know, fall break, spring break, winter break, 
and I thought, well, I could use that time to travel, especially the summer. You know, having a couple months off in the summer, I could still do the traveling that I wanted to do, but also have a full time permanent job, make a good income, and kind of have the best of both worlds, I guess. What do you invest in? Yeah. So today, my wife and I, we invest primarily in index funds through a brokerage account and real, and mostly real estate. I'd say we're probably 75% into real estate, 25% in index funds. We, we stopped. Actually, we stopped uh, contributing to our retirement accounts. We both have a Roth IRA. I have a, a 401k through my employer. And they're still there, but we stopped making contributions to those. And when we found real estate investing... Six years ago, we, uh, I wouldn't say we went all in, but we definitely ramped up our, our investing on that end, on that side of our portfolio and, and still do today. And we, we've stopped contributing and it's actually been a few years since we stopped contributing to retirement accounts. Can you talk about your decision to do that since that's sort of the, the like, that's the go-to, like you got to max out all your retirement accounts as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So how did you guys arrive at it? And what do people need to think about if they're thinking they want to stop doing that too? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think retirement accounts is, is a hot topic in the FI community and, and as it should be, I think, because everyone's strategy is a little different. And so what we decided for us, and this isn't necessarily what's best for everyone, but we decided, you know, we, we weren't going to work till we were 65. Uh, my wife is actually retired already. Um, we're in our 40s. I do still love teaching. I, I, I love my job and I love working with my students. And so I see myself doing that for a few more years. And so when we decided to, st we just, a retirement account is a great tool. I, I have nothing against it, but it is set up to really start. I mean, your money's tied up till you're 59 and a half or, or older. And, and we wanted access to our money before then. We wanted more control over what we were invested in through our retirement account. There's, there's a limited amount of things you can invest in when your money is in a retirement account. We wanted full control. We wanted access to our money whenever we wanted it. And so, you know, again, we didn't pull our money out. We didn't, uh, our, the money that we had in those retirement accounts is still there and it's doing well, but we just, you know, decided to, you know, any, any future investments would go towards index funds through a brokerage account or real estate. And uh, I don't regret that decision. So Doug, a follow-up question for you. I didn't know you had stopped investing in your accounts. Is it similar? What is your reasoning? Exactly that. Yeah. The money's tied up. It's made to not get to for a little while. And I know there's some ways around it, but I don't want to jump through all the hoops. And the other part is we maxed out a lot of stuff right when we got jobs. So that we have a lot of money in those accounts. So we felt comfortable um, in, you know, 30 more or 25 more years when we would touch it to really have a lot more than we would need at that time. So sure. yeah, we have taxable brokerage accounts um, that we put our money into now. Okay. Yeah. One thing I think people don't talk about enough is when do, I think capital gains started around a little bit over $80,000. So a post-tax holding investments post-tax can be great. And that's after the standard deduction. So you can make over $100,000 sell stocks every year and not pay any capital gains. And I don't think that's even being that frugal, living off $100,000 a year and no capital gains whatsoever. It's kind of similar to a Roth in that you've already paid your taxes because you're investing the after-tax money. Yeah. Yeah. And it just made sense to uh, have more flexibility, even if it wasn't the optimum like investment strategy. So. Got it. Yeah. What was your biggest money mistake, Dan? There's a few. Um, the, the biggest mistake, I mean, I, I think I definitely bought a few brand new cars in my 20s and 30s. I regret that. Um, I will never buy a brand new car. I, I shouldn't say never. Never say never. But uh, it's not on the radar to ever buy a brand new car. Buying a four or five year used car, I think, is much more financially savvy. But my biggest mistake would be uh, student loans. You know, we already talked about, I, I went to undergraduate degree, uh, undergraduate school and got a degree and that was almost fully funded by student loans. There were some scholarships and grants included as well. Then went back to school to get my teaching license. That was a two-year endeavor. Student loans paid for all of that. And then 
after I started teaching, I went back to school for yet a third time to get my master's degree. Um, I got an MBA and that was fully funded by student loans. And all through all three of those experiences, I, ha- I, I just, I, I was under the impression everyone else was that spending, you know, spending money on education by use of a student loan was always a great investment and is always, you know, a no brainer. You should just do it. Uh, and so you add up those three endeavors and I consolidated all the student loan debt into one loan soon after I finished grad school. It was a lot, tens, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars um, which isn't as much as some, but it was, it was, it's a significant amount when you're a public school teacher. And so that handicapped my financial um, picture uh, for, for decades. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't regret the way everything worked out, but I definitely advocate now that young people explore different options to pay for college and are, are informed about how student loans can and will affect their financial future before they just automatically decide that a student loan is is a, is a great tool because it can be, but it's not always the best. Why did you go back to get an MBA? Yeah, and I, I I don't think I would recommend a graduate degree for many people, but as a as a public school teacher, and I think this is pretty universal across the country, but obviously in Colorado where I'm at, it's it is true that once you get an advanced degree, your your annual salary goes up. It's it's the one way that you can start maximizing your salary as a teacher. So it, it was, uh, uh, you know, I, I analyzed the return on investment of the master's degree versus a career teaching with the higher pay that I would get with the master's degree versus without. And it, it was kind of a no brainer. I think it took three or four years um, to pay off the money I spent for the master's degree after, you know, earning a higher salary as a, as a teacher. And I think, you know, the education world values education. So they, t- teachers who have advanced degrees make more money than, than teachers who don't. And so for me, it was a good decision. I don't know for most people that an advanced degree would be. How much longer will you continue to teach? And are there any golden handcuffs holding you back now? Like you have a pension if you stay X number of years? As far as how long I'll continue to teach, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I would say five, six, seven more years is probably most likely somewhere in there. And, and one of the factors that plays into that is what you mentioned, my pension. I, pensions, they're always changing. And, um, and, call, and, and one, you know, a teacher pension in Colorado can look very different than a teacher pension in any other state. But for me, uh, if, I, if I go another six or seven years, my pension will be what's kind of the, the standard in, in the state of Colorado, which would be uh, a defined benefit plan where I get 75% of my annual salary until I die. You know, if I retire before that, the percentage goes down. If I continue to teach more than seven years, the, the percentage goes up. But the benchmark is um, to reach that 75% threshold. So I may do that, I may not. You know, our real estate investments are doing very well. The Sheik's Freaks community is starting to, to generate a little bit of revenue. Passive income from the book will play a role in that. So, but the bottom line is I, I still love teaching. So going to work every day is not a chore. It's not a he- it's not something that feels heavy, and so, you know, who knows? You know, we're, we're taking it one year at a time, I guess. Cool. And we're going to talk about the book later in the podcast. But for those who are interested in the book, we will be giving away copies. So stay tuned for that in part three of this interview. But the next thing we'd like to talk to you about is children and money, or kids and money, teens and money. This is a thing that's near and dear to my heart because I've been asked to speak. Uh, more than once, once at CSU and most recently at CU. And I always wonder, my CU, the last time I did that was a couple weeks ago. And you always wonder whether you're getting through to people because you look out there at the audience and probably a quarter of the students are looking at their phone so they could not care less about anything you're saying. But then there are some who are really enthusiastic and and they'll come up to you and want to chat you up after the talk is done. But you wonder they were probably already into it and I didn't really convince them of anything. So I'm curious, how do you get through to teens? How do you get through to someone who might not be interested in money and try to get them interested in this subject matter? Yeah, I think, you know, that that battle is very similar to the one you described, Carl, when you're talking to college students. It's it's not easy to get young people to 
become motivated to learn about their financial future. It's not, I mean, it's not easy to get teenagers to do anything <laughs> that they don't want to do. That's just a fact. So, you know, there are certain things that, that I do to pique their interest or to, you know, hopefully make them more likely to become interested. But at the end of the day, um, I cannot make a teenager want to learn about money. But, you know, I, I think in my, in the Sheik's Freeze community and, and in my classroom too, because I have taught personal finance as a class, talking about things like early financial independence, that option of not working until you're 65, that can get the attention of young people, I think, pretty quickly because they're not aware that there's another option. I, th I think the vast majority of people in our country believe there's only one option and that is to work until you're 65 and then, and then retire and live the good life. So, Laying out a foundation or, or an option of where early financial independence is something that's achievable and, and it's even an option at all is something that can interest young people. And so I bring guest speakers into my classroom who are young and who have reached early financial independence at an early age. And, and, and you know, they, they tell their story to my students and that's obviously much more relatable for them because they're younger than I am, my, my guest speakers. I also kind of like to throw out the idea of, hey, would it be cool? Do you think it would be cool if you could retire before your parents retire? And that can kind of pique their interest. And I, I don't like the word retire. I think most people in the FIRE community would agree that that's, that word isn't perfect. Um, it does make for a really great acronym, um, F-I-R-E. People who reach early financial dependence don't generally stop contributing and producing and working all together. They, they just choose to do those things on their own terms. And so presenting that as, as an option or as a possibility of, hey, you could, you know, if you follow certain strategies and do things a little differently, you could reach financial independence before your parents do. And wouldn't that be kind of cool? And they, you know, a lot of young people think that is kind of a neat idea. Not that it's a competition, but that, that will pique their interest as well. So it's just, you know, between guest speakers and now, honestly, with social media, um, the young people that I find who are most interested are highly involved with TikTok influencers, YouTube channels, um, Instagram uh, accounts that are in that space of early financial independence or some subset of that topic. And, and they're highly involved with those, um, those accounts and, and they're following and, and engaging with those. So bringing those into the classroom or those into the, the discussion also can be really um, effective. What kind of pushback do you hear from the students or younger people. We, we do sound very old, young, young kids, you know? Yeah. What kind of pushback uh, do you hear from them in general? About the idea of early financial independence? Yes. Um, not much, honestly. I think it's one of the things about working with young people is they're you now maybe to their detriment sometimes they're much more accepting of different ideas uh, and maybe just a little more trusting than, you know, that life hasn't smacked him upside the head too many times yet. And so, you know, I have to be careful with that. As a trusted adult, you know, I need to be careful that I'm not selling them a bill of sale to something that's not a proven method, but early financial independence absolutely is. And I also always say, I said this in my book throughout the book, I say this in my classroom, I say this in my community all the time, that early financial independence is not for everybody. Entrepreneurship is not for real estate investing is not for everybody. Everybody's path is different. I, I never tell anybody what to do. I my my mission I feel like is to explain that there are other options than the typical American dream pathway, and to educate them a little bit on what those other options look like, and then to say, now it's up to you to decide which path do you want to walk. Early fi sounds interesting. Then let's let's further the discussion or. Here are some resources you can go to to learn more. But if you're not interested in early five, that's, that's totally fine. Um, it is not something you have to do. It's not something I, I would tell someone to do. And it's not for everybody. The, the typical path of working until you're 65, there's nothing wrong with that. I say in my book, it's a very noble way to live and it's worked for millions and millions of people. And so if that's the path that you envision for yourself, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but- I will say that I've heard some people use that as an excuse. Well, I love my job, but I just want to work my whole life. And I think that's fine too. But I don't think you should use that as an excuse for not having your money together and maybe having a little postponement postponement of gratification so you've got that nest egg because 
as much as you like your job, your job might not always love you. Someone might get sick. Uh, a big pile of money in your back pocket is the ultimate, is one of the ultimate insurance policies in your life. You can deal with anything that comes your way, good or bad. You don't have to go to the Mexican Riviera and live on a beach. You can use that money to take a sabbatical to write a book you suddenly discovered you want to write or take care of an, el an, an elderly relative. So yeah, that's one caveat I'd say to what you just said. There's, uh, there's a lot of value to learning about how to get money right. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think um, the more basic personal finance topics, like you mentioned, Carl, uh, emergency funds, saving and investing, um, planning for your financial future, those things I am more urgent about with, with my students and, and the members in the community and saying that pretty much all of you should be doing some level of this, especially like you said, the emergency fund or plan, at least planning and thinking about your financial future. To take it to the next level of early financial independence, that becomes more optional. Do you think there's humans who are natural born savers versus spenders? Um, I don't know that I've ever thought about that. There are definitely are people who fit into one category or the, or the other. Are you born with that trait? I don't know. It's probably more learned. It's probably a behavioral uh, habit that's picked up from your home environments, although that's probably not true 100% of the time. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think some people are probably more conservative and so they probably uh, just by nature and that probably would tend to keep them more or have them be more of a saver mentality, I suppose. But, but anybody can learn the importance of saving uh, and then hopefully do what they need to to, to be uh, secure in their financial future. Where do you fall? Are you a sort of a natural saver? Was it always easy for you? I would say I am a natural saver, but I'm I, I'm a natural frugal person. But as we know, frugality isn't frugality still involves spending money on things you value. Um, and so going back to my twenties when I was traveling, I, I never let an experience slip away because I didn't have the money. If it meant putting it on a credit card. I would do it because I, so let's, you know, for instance, when I lived on St. Thomas, um, there would be some, you know, like maybe a catamaran trip my friends were going on or getting scuba, scuba diving certified so I could dive while I was down there. Those were things I knew in the moment that if I don't do them now, I'll probably never do these things or have these, have these opportunities again. And so even though maybe I couldn't quite afford it, I valued it. And so I still spent the money. But I was never spending money on fancy cars, fancy clothes, fancy restaurants, because I didn't value that. And so I would say I'm frugal, but I, I spend lavishly on things that I value. I have a really nice mountain bike that I ride all the time here in Colorado. Uh, most people would say that might be a waste of money, but for me, it's not, because that's something that I, it's a hobby that I really enjoy. Mostly, I'm just, I'm just frugal. So one of the things I really wanted to ask you about was, you, you know what, I guess I'll back up a second. So when I first started investing was right around 1999, 2000, when I had my first real job. And and back then, the big hot investment was the internet. So you had all these companies that had zero fundamentals, but people got tied up in them and were super excited and put money into them, including me. I remember I had one mutual fund. It was called Munder NetNet. I bought the thing for $10. It went up to $120. I'm like, well, I'm going to be rich. This is awesome. <laughs> and then it went to zero. So I, I think about the state of the world now, and perhaps we might get some hate for this, but perhaps the the thing most similar to that now are these memes, meme stocks and crypto. I imagine your students bring that stuff up all the time. Is that true, Dan? And what's your response to that? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, meme stocks, crypto, NFTs, all of those things are really hot topics with younger people who are you know, thinking about money or investing, investing. I don't invest in any of those things myself. That's not to say that it's not a good investment. I just don't know enough about them to make an educated choice uh, if I should and or should not invest there. So in my book, I talk about investing in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. And I, I tell the reader who, again, likely a teenager or a young person, I say, you know, Warren Buffett has some good advice. Don't ever invest in something that you don't understand. And I said, so let's take that advice and apply it to crypto. So I tell the reader, go to your parents and ask them, do you understand how cryptocurrency works? They're probably going to say no. <laughs> Most people I think would say no. All right. And so if that's the case, then explain to your parents 
how cryptocurrency works and how how that investment is a solid investment. And then when you're done, ask your parents and say, do you now understand how cryptocurrency works? You know, now that I've explained it to you. And if your parents still don't understand, if they're still very lost, then probably you don't quite understand it as well as you should in order to be investing in it. So until you really do understand all the pros and cons, ins and outs, upsides and downsides of cryptocurrency investing or NFTs or meme stocks, then I would keep your money away, at least any money that you wouldn't be okay losing forever. But I'm not going to tell someone not to invest in it. If they truly understand it and they have analyzed it properly and they think it's a great investment, then go for it. And, and obviously, some very, very smart people think that is the case. But don't just follow that, that crowd blindly and say, well, if Elon Musk is investing in cryptocurrency, then it must be safe and I should do it too. You need to do your own research and analyze it for your own goals and decide if it's good for you. Doug, have you come out with your Dougie coin yet? Not to be confused with D-O-G-E. They say Dogecoin, I think, for that, right? But you're going to have Doug coin, but you might be able to benefit from some of the confusion. Someone might go out to buy D-O-G-E coin, Dogecoin, whatever the hell that is, and end up buying yours just because they got confused. And if you get the mask like that, I think it's a Japanese dog, right? The Dogecoin, the mascot for it. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about, Doug? I do. Yeah, I know exactly. Okay. I'm, I'm starting to get interested in, in crypto. So that'll be a whole other show that we'll talk about. But I think we'll have Georgie, my dog, as the um, sort of the mascot. That is brilliant, Doug. Thanks. It does need to be a dog, yeah. I think. I think we might end up <laughs> having multiple shows on this. And, and Georgie can be a guest on that episode where we announce your ICO, your initial coin offering. She has a lot to say on it. <laughs> Um, let, let me know. I'll, I'll invest ten dollars, Doug. All right, I, I'm all in for ten bucks. <laughs> How many coins will ten dollars get? I'm, I'm curious I think for a myself lot. too. I okay. think a, a very large number. Really? Yeah. Wow. I'm not sure. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> what has surprised you most about teaching students about money? I, I think that's a good question. Uh, Probably the most surprising thing is is how varied young people are, not just with their interest level, but with their background. Especially in the classroom, you know, I have students who come in who who don't know anything about money. I mean, literally nothing. Their households, their parents have taught them nothing. They they don't follow any social media. They don't. They haven't read any blogs or listened to any podcasts, or they just have zero foundation. Whereas I have other students who come in. And, you know, say they'll, they'll take a personal finance class because they're extremely interested and they they're coming in with a lot of background knowledge and their foundation is very strong. But these kids are the same age and same year in school, uh, same community, same, you know, perhaps the same income level of house household that they they live in, but but very different starting points. And so I think I think financial independence or financial literacy is so important for everybody but it's pretty clear that we as a society fail when it comes to educating our youth or even our adults around um, personal finance topics because it is so varied when it really should be common knowledge for everybody. Wow. So I wasn't going to go into this, but now you've triggered a bunch of questions in my head. And I'll, I'll start with a little story. So Mindy and I have volunteered to teach financial education at our kids' schools, and they've gone to different schools, so multiple of them. No one has wanted to take us up on that. Like, they couldn't care less. Uh, one of my conspiracy, th conspiracy theories is that most of the adults, it's not that they don't want to learn, but you pull into the parking lot and there's all kinds of brand new cars. So they might be resistant to us because we're going to give a message that they don't really want to hear that might be in conflict with their own lifestyle. And I, I've wondered along the same lines if that's why parents don't teach their kids, they probably don't know. Uh, yeah, and, and that's part of the problem with our society. We can't learn from our parents because our parents don't know, but a lot of these messages would be in conflict with the way they're living as well. So I guess that's a long-winded saying of why don't we teach more financial concepts in school? Um, well, the answer to that is is not, it's not one answer. Um, th there's it's a systemic issue, right? I mean, personal finance has not been um, valued in our educational system for for generations, uh, all generations, and it's it's always been that way. The the, re, the 
to answer the question, why is that so? It's it's a little bit complicated. Um, my guess is, as, as a teacher, you know, the the teachers that you're you and many are reaching out to to offer your you know to come in as a guest speaker or to maybe teach a unit or something like that. My guess is the the more likely reason that you're not hearing back from them is because they're just busy. I, I have many people reach out to me asking to come in and talk about personal finance, marketing, entrepreneurship. And sometimes I, I take them up on it, but sometimes it's it's just one more thing that would add to my plate. And my plate is is so overwhelmingly full right now. My job, as we were talking about earlier, Carl, I'm working 50 or 60 hours a week. And so anything that adds to that is just not going to make the cut, which is unfortunate. I think, you know, across the nation, teachers are overworked and underpaid we hear that all the time, but it never changes and it probably never will, unfortunately. And so, you know, the idea of, of someone or even, um, I, you know, there's a lot of nonprofits and, and for-profit like banks and credit oh. unions who want to come into my classroom and talk to kids about, and, and bless their heart, you know, they're doing it for the right reasons, but to adjust the curriculum, adjust my lesson plans, to, to vet them, right? Because I don't want anyone coming in. I, I need to actually have a conversation with people and make sure that they are legit and they're not trying to sell something to my students, that takes time and I just don't have it as a teacher. But going back to the reason why financial literacy isn't taught in schools, you know, some people like to think there's a conspiracy theory behind that. And, and there might be, but I think the more, the more likely the reasons, and this is based on a lot of research and a lot of interactions I've had over 20 years, the, the number one reasons that it's not there is, be, is because of money and politics. Unfortunately, those and those reasons are why things don't happen for in a lot of different other areas as well. But public education is severely, severely underfunded. And so adding another requirement or adding another class to a school's curriculum or say a requirement as a, as a high school graduation does require more money and the money isn't there. I mean, there are so many things that we, we should be spending money on that are already underfunded. Um, things like infrastructure and and food for our kids i mean like real necessities that we don't have the money for so um and then the politics honestly is it's about schools are judged on data and most significantly uh standardized test data and and standardized testing doesn't test financial literacy it tests math science reading writing and those kinds of things so um the people, the school board uh, members, the superintendents, the principals, and the legislators who have the power to make make this change, who have the power to say financial li- literacy is going to be a requirement, um, for them, it's not a priority because they're not judged on personal finance. They're judged on those core subjects. So until that changes, I don't think we'll see change in our schools. Yeah, that's interesting. So it all goes back to incentives, which is the case for Many, many, many things in life. The incentives are mm, not yeah. in the right place. Uh, Doug or Dan, do you have anything else to say about children and money before we get into the book? Yes. Have you had any students that you've taught that are now either retired or pretty far along the path closer to retirement? Um, in my classroom, I would say probably not. But in the Shakespeare's community, um, I don't, the Sheik's Feast community has only been around for not quite two years. So they're, they're still very young. Um, but there are a number of them who are well on their way to early financial independence. And it will be very exciting to watch them continue that journey over the next few years. Uh, without a doubt, some of them will be um, reaching early FI in the next two, three, four, five years. And uh, I, I look forward to watching them do it. Nice. I was going to say, when I was... A teenager, I cut a lot of grass and saved a lot of money, but I had no clue what to do with it. And I probably could have retired when I was like 22 if you were my teacher when I was 13 or so. <laughs> Pretty sure I, I would not be sitting here right now. I'd, I'd be on uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous or something. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I found a lot of those. Uh, I want to talk about what you just said, Dan, when we get into the book. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about the book. I, I really like the origin story as to why you decided to write it with Scott and Craig, uh, but I'd like you to tell that story. But first, tell us what the name of the book is. Sure. Yeah. The name of the book is First to a Million, 
a teenager's guide to achieving early financial independence. And there's a workbook that goes with it. And it is called the first to a million workbook. So <laughs> pretty easy to remember that. They're both published by Bigger Pockets, both available right now. Passion project for me, definitely. Uh, I wrote it to give back. I wrote it to help others. And you know, my mission is to inform as many young people as I can about the option of early financial independence. And, and the book and workbook are, are definitely... Uh, designed to do just that. And what made you decide to write the book? Yeah. So that, that story is um, kind of a good one. I, you know, when my wife and I found the fire movement and, and real estate investing five, six, seven years ago, uh, at the same time, we also found bigger pockets and we found the Choose FI community. So we were just eating up everything in there, the podcasts and the blogs and the websites. Right about that time, I went to a meetup here in Denver at Bigger Pockets which is headquartered here in Denver. My wife and I went and we met Craig Curlap there, who at the time had just started working for Bigger Pockets in finance for them. He was at maybe 25 at the time. And he was, you know, just in that conversation we had with him, that brief conversation, I, I knew right away, I said, I need you to come into my classroom and talk to my students about all these things you're doing. He was house hacking, frugality. Um, he had some side hustles going on. And so he agreed to do that. He came into my classroom and talked and it went really well. Um, and so I said, I want you to come in next school year. I want you to come in on a regular basis and talk about these things with my, with my students. And he said, absolutely. I'd love to do that. And he said, I, I actually think my boss, Scott Trench will come in with me because he's really passionate about spreading this, this knowledge to young people as well. And I said, fantastic. Let's have you both come in. So they've been doing that for three or four years. Um, and when they, when they were starting one time they were in the classroom and uh, I think it was Scott asked a question to the students in the, in the class. At, at the end of the period, he said, he said, when Craig and I come back, what do you want us to talk about? What do you want us to cover? And one of the students asked or said in response, um, he said, I, I get all of this stuff. It, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I really want to learn more about it. But I, I really want someone to tell me what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Um, and, and give me the action steps, right? And, and I think we all appreciate very specific action steps. And that made sense to me. So I got the idea of creating a checklist for my students in the classroom. Um, and, and that topic was, we were, I think the day they were there, they were talking about house hacking, um, which, which both Scott and Craig have done. And so I thought about, well, I'll make a checklist for my students about how to go from where they are now to their first house hack. And that checklist grew into kind of a workbook. And that workbook, once I started getting all the information together, just be became two different. It was so much in there. It had to be two different books. So there's the, the book, First to a Million, and then the workbook that is kind of part two of that. Um, but the idea of writing a book, I never thought I would write a book. But Scott had written uh, Set for Life. And Craig was writing at the time the house hacking strategy. And, you know, I... It's all about who you surround yourself with, right? That that Jim Rohn quote that you are who you spend the most time with. And when I started spending time with Craig and Scott and they were writing books, I thought, well, wh why don't I just write a book then? Why don't I just write a book about this for young people? That's my niche. That's my wheelhouse. That's my passion. And if, you know, that just kind of ties in real estate investing, personal finance, early financial independence, um, and put that out there into the world and see if it can help some people. So- I think that's that's the story you're referring to. I think that that is it. How long did it take you to to write this book? It's very thorough and very well done. The whole time I was reading it, I'm like, how did Dan do? Did you do it in the summer when you were off, or multiple summers probably? If that was the case, yeah, it took two years to write the book. Uh, I started just by doing what I was doing anyway. I was listening to podcasts and reading other books and reading blog articles. So every time I would come across something which was really, really often that I thought would be good to have in my book, I would, you know, quote that or write that down or make a note. And then I just started organizing all those pieces into a book. The editing process was pretty intense. Um, and Bigger Pockets Publishing is is an amazing group of people and they helped with that. Uh, without their help, it wouldn't be near the book it is it is today. Uh, so it was, took about two years to write it and then another year to edit and design, which again was mostly on the bigger pocket side. That's, that's what they were doing. Um, so all, all in about a three-year journey. Okay. One of the things that I think is great about the book is it's a, 
it's a fun read. It's not boring. I think uh, there's one book I could think about in the FI community that's very well done, but it's very, very dry and it's all numbers. But your book is written in an entertaining way, which I think is what you have to do. What are the things you have to do to get through to to teens? I kind of laughed when I saw a Dalai Lama quote and then a Jocko Willink quote, two human beings who could be more far apart. I think if those two people ever got in the same room together, the universe would probably end. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's very well done and super fun read. As a teacher, I think one of our superpowers is the ability to explain things so that every student in our, in our classroom understands it or, or gets what we're talking about. That's a skill that's that's learned over many years. Um, I've been teaching for 19 years. So I think that definitely came through in the book. As I was writing the book, I, I wrote it in a way in my mind. Okay, so if, if a 14 or 15 year old is reading this book and they're starting from, again, a clean slate, they have no money foundation at all. I want them to finish the book. I want them to understand all of these things I'm talking about. So I wrote it in a way, I think, that um, it's very easy to understand for the teenagers so that they, they actually do read the whole book and don't, don't quit. Because if they, if they don't understand, if they get lost, they'll just stop reading the book. I mean, that's just what, that's what I do when I'm reading a book and it's so over my head or, or not well laid out, I just don't finish it. And so that skill of being, you know, being able to be very articulate in how we explain things as teachers, I think that was um, that's one of the highlights or one of the advantages of the book. So the Sheik's Freaks online community is highly intertwined with the book. You mentioned them a lot. How did that online community come about and where can people find it? Yeah, it started um, a couple years ago. Uh, I was just connecting with young people actually through bigger pockets, mostly in the forums. Uh, and I just had this burning desire to help young people learn about early FI. And so as I was talking to them on the phone, usually, or maybe a Zoom call, um, one of them said, you know, we should start some kind of a group because he wanted to connect with other young people like him. And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, why don't we try? He said, I, I know this app. It's called Slack. It might work okay. And so I started a Slack group and we just started bringing in young people who had uh, like like-minded uh, motivations and, and aspirations around early FI and real estate investing. So that grew and grew and grew, and it became a really solid community. Um, we've since moved on from Slack. We're now on a different platform that's very specific to our group, and uh, we continue to grow every day. Uh, and so any, anyone who reads First to a Million, I think, is going to want to join the Sheik's Freaks community because it's where they will find their squad, their tribe, of young people who are like-minded like them and who have the same goals. And so to find it, you just have to go to the, my main website is sheiksfreaks.com and you can learn about the community in, on, on the main website. One thing that I enjoyed about the book is many of the people who I met at your book launch, the Sheiks Freaks were, were interviewed in the book. You had a little two or three page interview and the <laughs> the question that that I really enjoyed that I thought was funny, uh, well, I guess there were a couple, like, how old are you now? And some of these people are like 18 or 19. <laughs> when do you see yourself as being financially independent? Uh, 22 or 23. <laughs> so, yep. so I think that's great. And I don't know if they'll actually make that 22 or 23. I'm a skeptic, so I'm slightly skeptical. But if they miss it by five years, they're still financially independent before they're, they're 30. And how awesome is that? <laughs> From meeting them, I think the Jabbar one really stuck out to me. I met him at your meetup. Just an incredible, young, dynamic, enthusiastic person. And then reading his interview, <laughs> that guy might do it before he's 22 or 23, whatever his number was in the book. He is uh, He is pretty inspirational, yeah. Um, you know, I think to reach early financial independence in your early 20s, I mean, that's a great goal to have. And if you get there, fantastic. I don't know that it needs to be the goal of everybody. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the right goal for someone is to reach early FI at age 35 or age 40. That's still two decades or maybe three before the average person. Um, Jabbar's crushing it. He is full steam ahead, pedal to the metal. Uh, he owns two, two real estate properties and he's barely 20 years old um, and he's not slowing down. And, uh, and that's, that's his path. But that you know, a young person who doesn't want to hammer it that hard still has a place in the community. Um, and maybe, maybe their goal is to buy their first property at age 25. 
great. You know, that's, that's fine. That's, that's not a wrong choice. And the Sheik's Free's community will help you get there. So I have one final comment. And that is, how do you keep kids from being too obsessed with financial independence once they discover it? And maybe I'm looking at you again, Jabbar, if you happen to be listening. <laughs> and I think of this in terms of my own life, because I discovered FI when I was 37. And I'm, I'm like, I just want to get here as fast as I can. This looks so awesome. But I don't think it should be people's primary goal in life. I think you should be able to live a life where you look back on, on your deathbed and that you're happy and satisfied with the way you lived. And maybe that is the pursuit of happiness above everything. And financial independence can live to that, but you can't sacrifice the journey just to get to this end point. And I know you talk about this in the book. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more, Dan? Yeah, that, that's super important. That is so important. I'm glad you brought that up, Carl. That is, there are many people who have reached early financial independence. And then who, you know, when you ask them, what would you do differently? They, they say, I, I wouldn't have done it so quickly. I, I wouldn't have. And two that come to mind are um, Brandon the Mad Scientist and Grant Sabatier, who I, I quote both of them in the book. Uh, and I think Grant's quote is exactly that. He said, you know, I wish I wouldn't have have been so focused and, and so driven to do it so quickly because in the meantime, things were out of balance for him. Um, and I think, you know, the, the purpose of early five for most people is freedom of time and freedom to do the things that make them more happy. Uh, and if you're s sacrificing happiness in the journey, during the journey to early five, then you're doing it wrong. That, that's something I believe very strongly. Um, things still need to be in balance. You still need to be enjoying time with your friends and family. You still need to be getting some physical exercise. You still need to be uh, enjoying life on your journey to early five. And if you're so focused and so driven to get there as quick as possible, then things will not be in balance. And that's probably not, I think it's not the right way to do it. Um, and so we need to learn from those lessons of people who came before us when they say, you know what, it's, it's a great goal to have but don't sacrifice your happiness to get there as, as quick as you can. And so, you know, young people have so much energy. They don't, they can, they can just, they can hammer and hammer and hammer. And, and that's great. Uh, I don't have that energy anymore. Um, but don't sacrifice your happiness in the present for a goal that's in the future. That would be my advice. Before I talk about the book giveaway, Doug, Dan, do you have any closing thoughts on the book? I'm good. Thanks, okay. guys. Yeah. So one of the things I really enjoyed about the book was the checklist at the end and then the accompanying workbook, which is an expansion of the checklist. I, if, and I read through the, the checklist. So the checklist has things like what books to read and what actions you should take and what you should learn about. Very, very specific. It's pretty long and very thorough. But I, I think if a kid gets this book and actually goes through that, they're going to be setting themselves up for a lot of success in life. So what we're going to do is give away three books. What you have to do is leave a comment on the YouTube channel, maybe write a couple sentences about a teen who you think could really use this book. You don't have to write the Odyssey. Uh, three or four sentences is, is fine. I'll, I'll pick out a couple. You'll send us an email, and then I'll get the books to you. And one follow-up for super extra credit is if that teen, once they, receives the, once they receive the book and reads it, if they could give Dan a little bit of feedback on it would be great. Maybe join Dan's community and let Dan know how they got the book from, from this podcast. So, yeah. Any? Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope this book, I, I think, I know you're pretty young. You're pretty new in the journey. You've only been doing this for a couple of years. The book is new, but I suspect you're going to have some kids reaching out to you in 10 years who are just dominating, and they're, <laughs> they'll be able to give you the credit for getting them off to that start, which is awesome. That's going to be super cool. Yeah, I already have in my mind uh, a future book, which will be filled with, uh, I hope, um, success stories of Sheik's Freaks members and first to a million readers, like you said, 10 or 15 years from now, and, and highlighting the journey that um, a lot of these young people are, are maybe going to embark on as, as they read the book and, and engage in the community. So um, that's my goal is to help as many young people as I can live their best life. Yeah. And if you're a young person who has been changed by this book, maybe consider joining the community and being a mentor. I, I could see that happening with your community. Maybe the, these kids who read the book and are killing it, turn around and do the same thing to other young kids that you did for them. So That's already happening. We already have some members in the, in, in the community who are kind of serving in a mentor role 
to the to the the newer members. It's awesome. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it then. Thank you so much, Dan, for your time today. And thank you for the book. It's really well done. Thanks, Doug and Carl, for having me on. It was a blast. I uh, appreciate what you guys are doing as well. Keep crushing it. And uh, look forward to talking to you guys in the future. Likewise. Thank you.